Scalini. Um, my, my official title is Learning Management Systems Coordinator for Front Range Community College. Um, I, I also have the other half of my life is instructional designer, which involves uh, support in the use of technologies uh, for people who teach with an online component or not, depending on uh, uh, what's going on. Um, as you can see, we're, uh, we just experienced some technical difficulties, and I'm going to log back into my machine here, and we'll get started in a moment. Um, uh, my co-presenter today is Kristen Rivadol. Hi, I'm Kristen Rivadol at Front Range Community College based out of the Westminster campus. Jim is based out of the Boulder County campus. Um, and I am college-wide um, faculty development coordinator. And then at Westminster, I am an instructional designer. So we, we all wear two hats through that realm. OK, that was Kristen introducing herself. Um, from, his yep, this is, this is my Lucy. Um, <laughs> From time to time, you'll hear me uh, repeating a question or, or offering some narration. Um, they're filming and recording this, uh, this session, so I'm going to try and do my best to play along. Um, so what we're, uh, what we're uh, looking at today is a desire to learn uh, specific uh, conversation about ways that we can track what uh, students are doing in desire to learn while you're doing your share, uh, perhaps as an administrator or as a, an instructor who's using desire to learn. Um, they're doing their share, and how can we uh, test the, the flavor of what's happening there? So I'm just going to wrap up the opening, uh, opening items here. Welcome. Please come in. And our reboot is almost ready here. At this rate, we're starting at 140, it looks like. <laughs> OK. Yeah, it hasn't changed a lot since you last saw it. OK. So as, a, as we talk about uh, capturing student data or viewing student data, we're going to focus on a couple different tools. Uh, user progress is an element that you can find in desire to learn um, in a couple different uh, um, places. And I'm going to tell you about this immediately available tool uh, that instructors can use without any uh, external support. So it's already there for you. Um, there's also a, a reports system built throughout desire to learn um, that offers some tool-specific snapshots as to what's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those flavors. And there's a lot. So I'm not going to give you a comprehensive look, but rather to uh, uh, give you just a general flavor there. An additional adapter? No. Um, in addition to that, um, one of the things that I personally get to use is uh, called the analytics tool. And the analytics tool is something that administrators, uh, a few at each institution, have access to that let you gather additional uh, data that instructors don't. So I'll be talking about those three. I'm going to uh, ask Kristen, could you please um, log us in uh, to D2L and load up the April uh, instructor session? OK, so uh, FERPA is the set of guidelines to determine what information I can and, or can't share with you about students. And given that we'd love to give you some um, windows into the live environment that we use and desire to learn as we do this, um, we've, we're circumventing that rule in that we're going to show you a class in which we have instructors uh, in a student role. This is our online instructor certification class. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of what we're doing there. But you're going to see some names and information. And I don't want you to be alarmed. Hey, that's a grade of someone, a real person. You shouldn't be sharing that. And the answer is, it's, I think we're circumventing that problem by dealing with adults in a, a professional development situation instead of students for grades. OK. Um, how many of you are instructors? And how many of you are using Desire to Learn already? And how many of you are about to be using Desire to Learn? OK, good. OK, so because of, the, of those different factors that are playing into uh, how your perspective is working here, some of what I talk about is going to go right on by. What did that word mean? That sounded like that meant something specific. So if I get to a point where I make a reference and I use a ter um, some terminology that you're thinking, that sounds specific. Stop me, and I will come back and, and uh, provide some context or, or wave it off if it's really deep context that would take us away from our, our process. OK. So we're, right now, we're in the uh, Desire to Learn course. 
uh, titled Online Instructor Certification. And we're going to flip back and forth between our PowerPoint presentation and this class. And uh, let's, uh, let's dig in. OK. So Kristen is manning the system there for us. That was our information. Um, again, we've, uh, we're at Front Range Community College, and we definitely want to share our experiences and best practices. And uh, well, part of the reason we're here is to establish connections with you. And um, if at the end of this you decide, I want to learn more about exploring this, um, please don't feel, feel shy. Uh, connect with us. And we'll have our emails up at the end. OK, so as we're talking about what information we have, available to us when we're using Desire to Learn. One of the first tools that we enjoy is a pretty simple one. It's the class list. The way Front Range has its um, enrollments configured is we have a banner um, system for student information management, enrollments, registration. And it directly advises um, the class lists enrollments in the courses in Desire to Learn. It's a beautiful configuration that I have no control over, and I don't want it because it handles um, putting all my courses in place and all of my students and instructors in those courses. Now, when I start getting complex and make combined courses that we call cross-listed courses, or if I get additional enrollments that are requested of me to add an additional instructor or an observer or uh, an online lead is another role we use, that's where I, as the administrator, get involved with the system. But the class list is a reflection of those that are uh, put there of a specific uh, type. So in the class list, we see information that we think is very helpful. We can see when was the point that the data, the class, that section, was last accessed student by student, or instructor by instructor as well, depending on what you're, you're trying to dig up. We can also see current enrollments. When a class list has a name of a student, that means that, by definition, they are on the roster as our banner uh, student information system has designated. When a student is dropped, it's removed from that list and put into a report that we can bring up. And we're going to talk about the value of that. Withdrawn student data. I get calls from time to time, so-and-so dropped from my class. I need to determine what their grade would have been uh, at that point. How can I get at that information? So readily available. After we finish with this screen, we'll pop over into a class list so you can see that. Um, we can also see if, if someone is online right now. A um, little green dot appears next to their name um, in D2L. Now, it doesn't tell you where in Desire to Learn they are, but it does tell you that they happen to be online right now. So if you're interested in connecting with someone and you know about the pager tool, for example, you can open up a pager to them right now if they're uh, hopefully got their ears on while at the, at the workstation. OK. And finally, we can access user progress, which we will. Yep. Class list, please. Um, it happens that this is where we put it in our navigation bar. Your system may choose where exactly those items appear in your navigation. So be aware that that's something that may differ. But ours happens to be at this position in our navigation bar. All right. Thank you, Kristen. And that's, that's a, we have a set of standards in terms of navigation that's um, a, an agreed upon set used by all the community colleges in the state um, as we all use the system. The purpose is to provide a uh, consistent experience if someone takes courses at different institutions. OK, so here we are looking at the class list. And again, it's, uh, we have a list. And it can be sorted by any one of these categories by selecting them. Um, so I can see the list of all these people who happen to be instructors at Front Range. They have an S number, which is a unique identifier. Ignore that. Forget those numbers, as if they were easy to remember. Um, their, their role. And here's that last access data. This class uh, was one that began in April, so don't worry. It's, it's OK that they haven't been on in months in this class. And I can pretty much tell um, at least something out of this. I can't determine what the quality of, of the activity was in the class that ended on these dates and times. But I can tell when it hasn't occurred. So um, seeing when someone has been in is, um, can be helpful. To the right, I have several different activity uh, options, one of which is this blue circle. And that leads directly to user progress. User progress is also directly accessible from the grades tool as well. So you can get to it uh, from two places. So let's, uh, I don't think, yes, sir? What does it say for never access? It's a blank. Uh, yeah, and the reason why uh, there's none of them that are in that situation is that this course has uh, ended. And as people said, it's not going to happen for me, we uh, unenrolled them. 
That's a good idea. Let's go to the report tool and we'll now take a look at what happened to those who were here, perhaps in the same situation. Okay, so in the report system, I have a summary of who and how many. Um, we have one demo student. It's a role that we cascade out to every single course so that instructors can see a student view of their course. Uh, we have one instructor HP. It's a specific role we designed with a few extra capabilities. And 23 students plus seven who were students and who are now uh, withdrawn. And here's the, an example that fits your situation. No last access. And as we roll through it, we can see different uh, days and times. And here's user progress again. So remember, we found user progress in the class list, which we're going to explore. I'm going to give you a little more context about what that is. And we also have a grades tool. That ruler with the check mark means enter grades in some cases, review uh, grades in others, but grade data. So if I am on the phone with the registrar or the appeals office, um, Richard Thompson was in your class um, and dropped. We need to know what the status was at the drop. I can hop in and by clicking on that grades tool and see these are the assignments that they did. These are the scores they earned. These are the comments that I provided. Um, just to give yourself a bit of a paper trail. So from a withdrawal stu uh, withdrawn student standpoint, it's nice to have that information. Those same data are also available in the grades tool for current students. So. Uh, it's a good place to get both of those. Let's come back out to class list, please. All right, and now um, let's let's just take number one and, and use the uh, go to the user progress there. Oh, are you looking? They performed well. Very good, very good. Kristen was uh, selecting a specific person because she was familiar with her her progress in the class. Okay. So here we are in a user progress screen. Again, this is not restricted to an administrator. It's available to any instructor for their students, at least in our configuration. Um, at the top, they give you a few choices about who you're talking about and which class we're talking about. So I can choose among classes in which I am enrolled in um, an instructor role. Given that we're logged in as an administrator right now, we've got the whole shoot and match to pick from. So we're going to stay in this current class and, and this current user. and there's a choice here of which tool you'd like to examine. So please click Change, and then click that pull-down menu. And these are the options they give you. Some of these options are very useful, and some of them provide only atmospheric information. The default is a system login history uh, option, which has, uh, has to do with their presence in Desire to Learn, not necessarily in your current class. But again, I can see what's not the case. If someone hasn't logged into the system since two weeks ago, then I know they haven't been in my class during that intervening time. So that can be of some value. The one that I use most frequently um, will be content. Content is, um, a, is a very useful tool to get a picture of both a student approach and also what's happening with the content that you've chosen to present. So let's start with the content summary. This person had two total visits, visited two of 51 topics. I don't think he chose the person you think he chose. <laughs> um, what I did was, was chose, she's got two different enrollments in the course. Okay. We can, we can back, up, back up to it. I'd rather get the, uh, the more rich data. Okay. So we've, we've identified that this user had more than one account and she was using the, a separate one. Question while we're looking at this. Okay. The, the question is, the listing indicated two of 51 topics visited. And what it means is, in the content area, there are 51 unique content topics, of which this user has visited two, and maybe more than once. OK? And, and total number of visits is identified here by number of visits. They had 146 visits and visited 60 of 60 topics in this view. Okay, so this is this is another account with the same user, the one that she used for the for the balance of the course. Sure, I'm looking at a class that's a summer class that was in the summer, and there are two different students that three under number of visits next syllabus. So that means she looked at the syllabus. 
The question was, in uh, looking at her own class list from a course she taught this summer, an instructor has three next to the number of visits for a specific topic, the syllabus. And, that, and yes, you are correct. That's how many times they, unique times they came to that page. OK, so um, now we can see Deborah was a better student than we at first uh, uh, saw. 146 visits, um, maybe not to all of these places, but to uh, reach them all. We have 60 topics in the course that we asked um, our students to uh, examine. And here's the listing of them. And next to each one, there's, a, uh, there's some individual data. Uh, we have a number of visits, which is what we were just referring to with the syllabus. And we can see this, uh, the person whose progress we're checking is the first column. Um, so looking at the introduction description, five times they came. And the class average, 5.24 times. So. Somebody came more than once every once in a while. But uh, what, this, what this implies to me is that for this user, this was pretty valuable. They kept coming back for more information. And it was um, pretty much in sync with what the average user in the class was doing. The last time was on April 10th. Wow, they came how far into the class? I see May. Eh, that's, that's maybe a week into the class. OK, they got what they needed. They left. So, Again, I'm not breaking ground here that's tremendous. Oh, I'm going to change my teaching style. But at least I've got a snapshot. It's being used. As I come across, I can see the next column is total time spent. And again, I also see after that an average time spent. So on average, just less than a minute. And the class spent just less than 33 seconds per visit here. Yes? Yes. Um, I'm going to talk about a, situa a situation where we're trying to track time and why I think it's, a, it's, a, it's empty data in a way. But I do not distinguish between someone who's there, observes, and moves away, and someone who turns on the TV while on this page uh, making sure it refreshes. There is one situation where data is not tracked correctly in this screen that we're really aware of. Because we have students coming to us saying, my, my instructor's telling me they're tracking the time, and I'm not getting the credit I deserve. And they're right. Um, if a student visits a topic and lets the um, session time out, the, the phone rang, the, the laundry was going, the kids came home, and my session time's out, it, it counts the number of sessions as zero, and it counts the time as no time noted. Um, if they haven't visited anything, you see a zero, like right here. That means that's exactly what occurred. Okay, and zero time. A dash means no visit has been attempted to that item. Okay. The question was, what if there's a dash? No visit. Okay. So as I look at this, I'm getting, a, I can get a snapshot of what, in this case, Deb visited, how long she was there, what. The others in the class did in uh, similar uh, circumstances on average. And I can look for anomalies. Um, if, the, if the average visit for, let's see here. This is the total. This is the average. So if the average visit for Deb is way out of spec, 36 minutes and 13 seconds on this web link versus the average of 3 minutes and 44 seconds, that's where I might see, oh, that could explain a difference in performance or a level of participation that happened there. So it kind of helps if you come in sort of stocking your, um, your, your ammunition in the right area. I know I'm looking generally for how did, uh, how did this person do with quizzes because their performance was out of spec with the average in the class. Oh, they spent a much greater time. Could it be that they found the instruction there less than helpful? Could it be that they found, found it so distracting that they didn't attend to the other issues that were related to the assignment where they didn't do well? So this type of data relies on me to draw connections, establish relationships between time and links, and the results that occur elsewhere. Yes, ma'am? If they, the question is, can they just turn it on and leave it on and give the impression that they're doing things there? And the answer is yes, they can. Um, the maximum time limit, if they are able to log out or navigate away, they could, they could not be at that computer. And that's the number one reason why I look at this and say, if I'm coming here expecting comprehensive reasons for everything, I'm going to be disappointed. 
But if I've got some salient issues and I can find some data to support my thinking about why they occurred, that's the value. Okay? All right. Um, let's switch over to the PowerPoint to make sure I haven't missed anything on, on uh, this area. Okay. Let's slide into the next screen. Please. <laughs> okay. And I've given enough presentations with online components that I know that the system is going to go down, which is why we've got some screenshots here. So you can ignore the man behind the curtain. I even hid the names and, and numbers on this one. But, um, so this was from the withdraw screen. Uh, it's an indication of the different items. This was the list of tools that are available. Um, each of the, of the significant tools that an online teacher can use do have some user progress information discussions, Dropbox, grades, quizzes, surveys. Um, I don't focus on them quite as much. They can give me some data, but the content area is the only one where date stamps are loaded in, where I get this specific. I know what someone visited and when they visited, or for how long. So I look at this um, as the most useful one, and that's why we, we emphasize that. Um, if we have time after we roll through the whole element, we can come back and visit uh, individual tools, um, user progress tools in those other areas. Okay, so how did this come around to help us? I was approached by um, our nursing department who has a state standard that they've got to meet and whether or not we agree with it, one of the elements of the state standard for hybrid class that, in which we're teaching nursing is that students have to have X amount of hours demonstrated per week um, in class, in a class session, and Y amount of uh, hours per semester total. And I had conversations with, uh, uh, with uh, my nursing instructors in which they said, this, I, I disagree with this, but I'm going to play ball, and I'm going to make sure that we are doing our due diligence. And so the first part of the, uh, of the idea is I'm going to lay out my content, I'm going to track time. I'm going to instruct students about how not to have those timeouts occur so that they get accurate pictures of, of their progress. And I'm going to understand that, as was suggested, there may be some who say, this is irrelevant to the work. I'm just going to turn it on and go watch television and make sure that it doesn't time out. And they were okay with that. The reason why they were okay with that is that they knew that truly assessing people is going to ha have to do with my interaction with them, my my reflection not only of their time, but the quality of that time and the results of their work during that time. But I still had the request and the stream of, of questions that came in from students during the term had a lot to do with, I want my time to be tracked correctly. I'm in the class, I'm working, and in some cases it's, it's, the details are, are not working out correctly. So I spent a good deal of time saying, let's, let's make sure that we are clicking to uh, other areas rather than letting the machine um, time you out when you're done a session. Um, another area that we found, um, you can defeat the, uh, the time tracking if you use a search. If you go to the content area and you've got a very long list of content, I know I'm looking for uh, something about learning process, and you do a search for it, it'll bring up that search result. You have now left content, so the visit to that topic will not be tracked. So that was another nasty surprise, but again, when I really come to the end of the day, I, I, I know that the nursing department in, in our college is trying to do their due diligence and, and track data, but I think that it can be used as part of a more comprehensive snapshot to determine student progress. So, um, so those are some of the pitfalls. I like the common ground that a student and an instructor can both look at that same screen of user progress and say, you, I see you were in on April 17th in, and for two hours starting at... 2.13 p.m. And the student can look at it and say, yep, I see the same thing. I think that's helpful. Okay. Let's see here. Let's, let's keep moving. I think we've, we've, uh, we've beat that horse. Okay. Most definitely. Okay, now Kristen's going to talk about reporting. little theater moment here, sorry. I feel like I'm back at the Shakespeare Festival. <laughs> All right, so um, on a level that's not necessarily looking at what students are doing on an individual basis, but 
to track how your students are using your material so that as I use this a lot of times to talk to faculty about gauging whether what you are doing in the desire to learn system is an effective use of your time and an effective for your students. Is it being used? Um, there are a number of reports you can use to look at um, how students are accessing different material. So I'm going to start with going to, this is an instructor view of a page. Oh, um, oh you went straight to content. So we've gone to reports here in the left navigation there. And I have a couple of different options here. It lands me on a page that shows me every content topic I have in here. And I can see that 22 of my students have viewed the syllabus. Um, as we get down here, 16 of them accessed a web link that I put in there. So why did I suddenly have, um, what, six of my students not looking at things? OK, maybe that's less effective for the web links. Um, you know, they, they followed, a, a 21 of them followed a link to a PDF that had lecture material, but again, they're less engaged in links. And so as a teacher, I can start looking at what material students are accessing and whether or not that's a good use of my time to put it in to find these kinds of things. Um, some cases, yes. Um, it'll show me where I've got things that were loaded in but are hidden. It's got this little, that's a closed eyeball. It's hard to see that it's doing that, but... <laughs> Um, and so that's a hidden piece of content, so no student could access that. But we've got it in just in case students ask for a given kind of content. We can just open it up and show it to them later. It's already there and waiting. If I flop from con the content tab over to the users tab, then I a quick snapshot of how many content topics has any given student visited. So we've got somebody here who only visited 10 content topics out of 60 probably not one of our more successful participants. Yes? Um, we, you click on content wherever it appears in your navigation bar. In the left side of your screen, there's a thing that says reports. And then there's two tabs. One's content, one's users. And I like it. <laughs> um, and so you can see as a I, again, this is not how I would specifically access this. If I clicked on a student name here, you don't need to. Um, if I clicked on a student name here, it would take us to exactly the same content report in user progress that Jim had just shown us. So you can get to that same thing a different way, but this gives me an overview of my course, and I like, I like a, a less granular picture. Not in these embedded reports. There are other tools either available or soon to be available that will give you that data, and Jim's going to talk more about that. Those are some things that are sort of on the horizon, but maybe not quite here yet, but there are, they are coming. Yeah, I was going to say, let's go ahead and go to discussions. The question was, in some of these screens, is it possible to export the data? And at the top of each of the screen there um, that we've shown so far, there's a green export uh, to CSV file that you can open with Excel. So in that, in that you can export it to a CSV file and bring it into Excel, you could then start making your own charts. And that might be easier for you to look at and get a better feel for. Um, so in discussions, if we go to statistics, again, in the left navigation area. Um, there are more granular statistics if you want to look at any given discussion forum or discussion topic. This is for discussions as a whole. How many messages have been authored? How many have been read? Bearing in mind that they have access to a button that says mark all as read and once you've done that they show up here. <laughs> so. Um, there are ways to monkey these statistics. I don't grade people much based on these statistics, but I look at it to get a feel for if I've got somebody who's got uh, 40 discussion messages read out of, you know, what look to be close to over 1,000 messages. Yeah, yeah, somebody's reading 40 again. 
I will say I'm picking on that particular instructor. He had to drop out of the class, so. So the comment is that in discussions, there's two different ways you can view that. And for people who are brand new to D2L, you may not know that there's a grid style that shows you just a subject line of discussion messages, and there's a reading style in discussions that has all of the messages out in full text. And if you're viewing it in that reading style, you are not required to click to mark that you've read it, even though you've physically read it. You know, I, I read through all the material. Um, I believe that the default of what that comes up as is a system level setting. And so if you're not happy with what it comes up by as a default, it may be a conversation to have with your system administrators. And there are pluses and minuses pedagogically to both issues. Um, there is reason to say that people are more likely to read things if they're out and open, even if they don't get marked as read. So there's, there's advantages to both of those options. Um, let's go to Dropboxes. I don't think there's, there aren't really reports on Dropboxes, but there's some places where you can see some data. Um, go ahead and click into this. This is a place where they upload in this particular course something they have several months to complete. But when students have uploaded material, it'll say that I'm ready to leave them feedback. This tells me I've left feedback. And scroll down and see if we've got one that says red. Oh, here we go. OK, so I up, when I left feedback, I can see that then Marnie came in and read her feedback within a week or so of my having left feedback for her. And so as an instructor, if I've got somebody who's making the same mistakes four assignments in a row, I can come back in here and look at that and see, oh, you know, you've never read your feedback. You've seen your grade, but you've never read your feedback. And that's a really handy thing for me as a teacher to be able to talk to my students about. You might notice in the screen that the date that the feedback was left is after the date the feedback was read. It implies that there's been more than one version of that feedback that's been sent. It's not a time warp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, quizzes. Um, again, there's a, a tool on the horizon that will give you even better data than what we're about to show you as far as analyzing your quizzes. But let's go into the statistics on the overview quiz, please. All right. In general, overview quiz, just for groundwork on what this is, it's a syllabus quiz. We require, we've made it in this course that they can't get to the course content until they've read all my overview material and attempted this overview quiz. Now, they can score zero on the quiz and still get to the rest of the content, but you have to read the content and take the quiz. Otherwise, you can't get to my weekly content. Um, you'll see that the average is 84%. Um, yeah, you know, it's skewed towards the top. That's actually a nice thing on a syllabus quiz. It's not terribly tough if you've read the material. Um, you know, there's some people who blow through it pretty quickly. And so I can see what the average is on individual click question stats, but we're going to go to details pretty quickly. If I know exactly what each question is, I can get a feel for which questions people are missing more often. But I get a better view if I go to question details. This reads my question out to me and shows me what answers people are picking on my quiz. And so I can see consistently, well, four people out of 22 picked this as the right answer when it was not the correct choice. So that's maybe an issue I need to emphasize more clearly. And so it lets you evaluate your quiz and maybe your wording as you're looking at a question. If you see consistently people are picking a consistently wrong answer. So. So when, I, when I'm looking at the design of my class, if I'm using quizzes to track student performance, and I see uh, a lot of situations like we were showing you earlier where dominant answer, everyone's getting it right with a few exceptions, I can either pat myself on the back or I can say, gee, did I, did I push the envelope far enough with what I'm asking? And here's the, the opposite situation. I've got 
a significant number uh, getting it right, but I've got some distribution of answers. These are the ones where I'll have another look at it. Did I choose my topic well? Did I express it well? Did I provide enough content for students to have a fighting chance on this one? So uh, seeing this type of feedback helps me decide, am I assembling my course effectively? I think we should go back to the PowerPoint because I think we're coming close to where you get to speak again. We were, we were at a technical conference in April where there was like no internet connection, so we were prepared to not be able to show you live, so we have lots of screenshots. Um, but when I see the word analytics, I see Jim Piccolini speaking, not me. Okay. So we've been talking about the class list and user progress at the start, again, available to any instructor. And we've been talking about reports, also available to you. You just have to dig a little deeper in those cases. Um, now we're going to talk about a tool that's available to your, um, very likely your chief administrator of D2L on your, on your campus, and not to anyone else. But we can take data from this analytics tool and export it. I'm going to come back over here just so I can uh, um, navigate through some of uh, the results that come out of this. So analytics um, is a much higher level view of data. In other words, I can grab the data, which is uh, a splash from an entire class, but I'm not going to be able to drill down to pick tool data to share at this time. Um, we've got to say, as I worked with um, uh, our central office for the community colleges, we look at this all the time to say, what can we get out of here that's really useful? And, and we talk with Desire to Learn about what we're hoping analytics can provide. And so far, it's the tip of the iceberg of what we see potential here. There's a couple things that we found that are very useful. But there's a number that really aren't developed to our satisfaction yet. So we're, we're giving them feedback, and we're hoping for um, some response on it. Yeah, sorry. I'm just thinking up here, because on the, the th nearly three-day lag, understand that this analytics tool is actually pulling not from the live iteration of Desire to Learn, but from a data warehouse. So it's pulling data from the last time they warehoused data, which is why you have a three-day or so lag on your data. OK. okay. And, and that is an accurate description of it. So let me take you back to our model I was discussing a little while ago. The nursing department needs to track time that students are spending in class. Whether or not we agree with the goal, we can at least reach the goal and help with the, uh, the mechanics of it. The way we were looking at it before was user progress, which in many cases does track tool by tool what's going on. But in some cases can be defeated when someone doesn't navigate correctly or uh, to fit the bill. Um, that's when I will come back and suggest, well, let me give you an analytics snapshot of the same course, and it will track your whole login in the org unit, in this case, in your class. Um, I can also provide that information individually or as a class as a whole. Um, there's a repository of reports. If I design a report I really like and it's, it's hitting the mark, I can save it. Um, I can also set it to be emailed off on a schedule to an instructor. So if in these nursing classes, that's what we did. We said. OK, we're going to track sessions in your class, and we're going to send it to you every Wednesday. And it'll tell you what happened up till Monday of that week. Okay. Um, the ad hoc reports are where I design my own. Um, and again, once they give, give me a more robust group of tools, I will love it. Right now, I like it. It's good for certain things like this, um, uh, like this angle. We also have a brand new tool that Desire to Learn has put into place called the Analytics Portal. We've been experimenting with it, and I'm going to show you that screen before we're done. And you want work in progress, this is work in progress, in my opinion. So I'm not satisfied with where that's, uh, that's at yet. When you first load up analytics um, for your institution, you get top-level snapshot data. And much as it's interesting, I can't really apply it so much. I find it interesting that Internet Explorer is by far the dominant browser, given when I'm using Desire to Learn, how most of my problems occur when I'm using Internet Explorer as opposed to some of the alternatives, OK, that's fine. Um, I've got a significant Firefox group. I've got a Safari group, which tells me more about my number of Mac users than the, a browser choice, I suspect. And there's some others at play here. And I see Netscape still has a presence here. Wow. OK, so Desire to Learn tells us what its uh, recommended browsers are. And it has a very specific, narrow version number of 
Internet Explorer and Firefox for Windows, plus they're supporting Chrome, but they're not telling us what version. And Firefox and Safari, not the most recent versions for Mac. So when I see these other browsers, it's a reminder that not all of our students are doing what we recommend they do to get to the system. And so they might be having problems that we don't anticipate. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, these are the top enrollments, the number of people that are enrolled in courses. And our number one is sample course last spring. And right after that, we have an online student union. So these are um, cross-listed courses where I say, everyone in every class enroll in this one too. And we've got some nice tools to do that, which is great. And it doesn't bring the system down. I can remember in some other unnamed system how if I went over a 1,000 items to or per persons to do something, I could crash the entire system by trying to make an action with them, as opposed to when I created this with 21,500 some. So I love the stability of desire to learn. Um, that's just a nice snapshot. So this overview, um, I also have a places to go to my repository or to create an ad hoc report. And again, I'm not going to go through the whole process. I'll just give you screenshots along the way because it's not speedy. Um, but they tell I can choose what org. Well, I can. I work for Front Range, so we'll start there. But I can break a, a report down by what role that I'm looking for within an org unit. And then choose a department, or in, in some cases, a group of departments. So I like this flexibility if I, uh, if I can get far enough into it. We have semesters, and I was referring to the course we were just looking at, a training course, which is in our training semester. And there it is. And I'm grabbing sessions and giving it a time uh, and date set of parameters. So when I do this, if I was doing this for the current semester in nursing, I would navigate down to a specific course and section and time frame there that doesn't fit uh, right here. But after I do so, I am brought to a screen where I can choose data um, that exists in Desire to Learn's um, repository. So if, the, if I choose a data set, and this is um, user session history is the set we're working with here. I'm limited to what they have associated with that data set. So I pick name or username, start and end date as I'm trying to solve that nursing problem. And I generate a report. And this is a sample of the data that it would produce. Each line of these is one session, when it started, when it ended, and, and who it was. OK. Say it again, please. Yes, sir. This is a GUI that, um, that is a separate uh, environment, uh, but taps into the data uh, which is created by everyday use and desire to learn. So. Your, your system may or may not have bought. It's separate from the yeah. learning environment. It's separate from the learning object repository. Um, so if your system has purchased analytics, you will have access to this. OK. So. I had two on here. I'm just looking for my other analytics shot. Huh. OK. Well, I guess it got blown out here. I've got my refined version, but my, not my unrefined. OK. Well, I'll just talk about what, uh, where I ended up. Basically, you get a CSV, which is a uh, comma-separated values file. And it comes with certain columns. Um, and it's, in, it's presented using criteria that they choose. What I do with that data is I immediately sort it. I dump the labels. Um, I sort by the date of a session. And then I reorganize by um, the name. And I also create a new column by which I find the difference between um, the start and the end of a session. So I can tell how many hours, minutes, and seconds each session was. So pulling that data out, I get this raw uh, mass. And I say, OK, I'm going to whip it into shape and, and group it by the user. And then I use the, the subtotal command. And that's how we, I got these columns here on the side. So let's go through and see how, in this case, Lucinda Baker, each one of these is one of her sessions. At the total, she had 40 hours, 28 minutes, and 42 seconds in, the, in my class. OK, so there's some valuable um, reflection there. If I'm looking at Lucinda ba uh, Baker's success in the class, can I find a relationship between that and the total time in her sessions, the total um, time of any individual session? Some are eight minutes. Some are two hours and 25 minutes. It's just a snapshot of, of her access. Here's another person who was in a net of two hours, eight minutes, 11 seconds. 
want to bet that they were one of the people that didn't get to stay around in the class. So um, I can collapse any one of these. And I can see all the totals together. And so here's my snapshot. So who are my A students um, along the way? Is there a relationship here? It pays to explore rather than assume. So, um, but this data is what I could hand off to my nursing department to say, in the week frame of this start to this end of this week, here's how your people are doing to meet your state's uh, requirements. Or from the start of the semester to right now, here's how they've been doing overall. You can tell who's going to have to really put in some extra hours to get your, uh, your credit in the class. It's imperfect, but it's, it's actual data. And that three-day lag, in some cases, make, uh, makes my uh, instructor say, this isn't cutting it. I want to, I want to have a, uh, on a more immediate um, barometer of what's going on, in which case we come back to user progress, which is immediate. It, do, it deals with the active environment instead of the stored environment. So the latest thing that D2L has brought along is the analytics portal. The analytics portal has all the potential. And it's exciting because it's a case where I'm not acting as a filter for the nursing department in their class. I'm saying, here's the tool. Put it in your hands. You check right now how your logins have gone. Now, there's some ups and downs there, and we're not ready for prime time. The most useful one that we've seen right now is user logins by um, org unit and role, very similar to the analytics report I just showed you. But there's a, there's a problem there. The fly on the ointment is this is an org-wide tool, meaning that if I come in and look for a student's progress, I can see everything that they do in all their classes that they've ever taken, every student. Burpa says, I don't give data to you as an instructor unless it's a student that you're teaching right now. So I look at this and I say, what a great tool for student services to help provide support and track information to find out uh, what's going on in active role of supporting students. Instructors can't have access to it because of that reason. Each of these other ones are works in progress. We see the names and we say, we see something coming that could be of great value when I get there. I want to see what my statistics are as a class, as a whole, um, with a specific um, question that maybe appeared in multiple assessments. Or could I do it across multiple org units? I have two different classes. So I look at that and I see potential. But these aren't ready for prime time. They, they're glitchy. And what it says to me is desire to learn is in a position where they are actively listening to things we're requesting because some of these are things we actually said we really want this type of analytics access in the hands of our instructors so it's it's in progress so I can't fault them for rolling it out early enough so I can see what's going on and I'm feeling patient about it so uh, to wrap up we've got uh, we have a, a few different tools again I want you to walk away remembering that user progress is available to you right now in your classes um, reports are available to you right now in your classes. And we've only shown you a fraction of the reports. So it's really a matter of digging in and finding, I know I'm going to be using discussions, and to spend a little time under the hood to see what, um, what data is already captured for you. And sometimes it can help you think, well, what do I want when I can see what's possible? Um, Kristen and I are available if you're starting this process and you're thinking, I, we've got a department or we've got a college that's uh, spending some time thinking about how we're going to um, explore this. We'd love to compare notes with you and, and uh, track along the way. Please be in touch with us, and um, maybe we can compare data. Um, I'd be, how much time do we have left, I guess, is there? Yeah, five minutes. OK. Um, is there, are there any questions that you might be having? I'm, I may have just diverged from what, where you thought we were going, but is there any, are there any questions that we could um, maybe address? Very good. So the question is, um, uh, the person asking is a TA in a class in which there are 90 students, and she's personally responsible for tracking the progress of 30 of those students. She wants to know is, what's the way to, to develop a consistent look so that all three of them are talking about the, um, the same, same data in the same way. And 
I guess my, my answer is um, it's, it's less uh, technical and more social the way I look at it. I think step one is as a group sit down and explore what all the tools allow you to do with some existing data um, in a set. So maybe starting on day one you might be more conservative about what you try to do with it. Um, I think step two is ident identify among those um, specific salient ones that you know you're going to talk about and leave it open to report back. I found this element that will explain this situation or at least could be a contributing factor. So I think the, it's a social experiment where get familiar with the data and then find where it, can, uh, it um, happens to point to point, uh, students who are either in trouble or successful. Um, I think there's, as Kristen mentioned along the way, um, one of the best reasons you could use this is to, for you to track your own content. If you have something that you've been working diligently on, I made this wonderful video resource with a, with a Prezi uh, presentation that attaches to it, and boy, it took hours, but it's what I wanted. And then I take a look, and three of my students looked at it, and they had the worst scores in the class. Well, maybe I need to rethink how I present that, how I incorporate it, and point people to it. So I think that's, that's something that could possibly have more value right out of the box. Um, Absolutely. The, the question was, wouldn't it be the responsibility of a lead instructor to, to coordinate um, the work of their TAs? And I, absolutely. I, I think that uh, I agree with that statement, and yet I think there's a value if you have many eyes finding best data. And yes, maybe you're not the decision maker in that scenario, but you could at least bring some data to the table. So. Any other questions? Yes. We have not yet found an upper limit. Um, among the 13 community colleges in the state who all share the same tool um, that we, uh, uh, we've purchased, geez, how many? We're, we're the largest college uh, among the group. I mean, uh, how, how many students would you guess? Well, we just looked at the numbers. So last spring we had It was 20, 22,000, but we're also talking about all the colleges. And so. So the question was how, how the system has supported um, the number of students we've got. And we have found among our 14 colleges that it's supported it very well. And that uh, the state of Wisconsin, for example, has a, a, an entire population all on a server. And they haven't had performance problems that we have heard. And that's about that's, it. That's a year and a half, two years, we've had one eight-hour period. In two and a half Beyond years, we've had a one eight-hour period where performance was so slow that we noticed it. And we agree that it's very stable. OK. Well, so that I don't hold you up before you get to the next one, or stay for Steve Kaminsky's follow-up uh, uh, presentation, I, I want to uh, thank you for your attendance. Um, please fill out your uh, evaluation forms and leave them on the, on the table as you go. And please be in touch if you want to talk about this. We may have come tangentially close to what you wanted to hear. We're happy to have a conversation with you. Or anything else. We'll talk about anything. Signing off.